Today, we are going to talk about battles. But before, I have a confession to make. I receive research funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 program, which includes Italian taxpayers' money made in part from selling pizza, spaghetti, and tortellini. <laughs> and I use that money to support my way of life, avoiding pizza, spaghetti, and tortellini and even teach the students at Stanford University to avoid pizza, spaghetti, and tortellini. <laughs> and despite all that, I still have the audacity to call myself an Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and now that I, I can go in peace, let's talk about battles. The battle of the sexes. Who doesn't hate it? Who doesn't love it? Whether it's about winning a match on the tennis court or losing some pounds on the bathroom scales. How many of you have ever engaged in a weight loss battle with a friend or a partner of the opposite sex? Please raise your hands. Hmm. I see a few hands up, and I'm sure those battles were fun and frustrating at the same time. But what if the battle of the sexes could not only make us smile and sweat, but also help us understand and change the world around us? The tennis match between Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King in 1973 drove social change in women's sport. Could perhaps the battle of the sexes even help us improve the way we do science and medicine? You really don't need to look very far. Just look around you and see how different men and women are from each other. On average, men are bigger than women, and women are better dressed than men. <laughs> the question is, might these differences affect the way men and women respond to a drug? or diet intervention? Could we and should we use these differences to personalize healthcare? These questions are now more relevant than ever as we move from one-size-fits-all medicine to precision health or personalized health, a new healthcare paradigm in which treatments are tailored to people's unique characteristics. Today, we will answer these questions together on a surprising journey across science and society, biology and behavior. Along the way, we will see how the battle of the sexes helped my team at Stanford University find out something new about the way men and women respond to a low-carb or low-fat diet. Let's start with a practical example of how sex differences can help us move from one-size-fits-all medicine to precision health. Imagine you want to make a suit for these men and women. The women are in white, the men in black, and they are distributed by height from left to right. Which sides would you pick for this suit? If you put men and women together and pick one size based on their average height, how would that suit look like? 
It will be too large for most women and too small for most men. It will basically look terrible on everybody. That's what happens when we apply one-size-fits-all medicine to groups of people with different characteristics. So what if we pick instead two suit sizes, one for men and one for women, based on their respective average heights? Wouldn't those two sizes be a better fit for most men and women? That's what precision health is all about, tailoring healthcare to the specific characteristics and needs of different groups of people. This tailors quest has many parallel with something we found out in our analysis of the Stanford Diet Fit Study by Professor Christopher Gardner, which is today the largest precision health trial in low-carb and low-fat nutrition. This was a study of 609 overweight men and women who were randomized to a low-carbohydrate, low-carb or low-fat diet and followed for one year. It's important to note that both diets were focused on quality and therefore minimized processed food, refined grains, and added sugar. The main idea of the study was that one diet doesn't fit all. And that's why we wanted to find out which diet may be better for which people based on their unique characteristics, such as genetics and insulin secretion. However, in our primary analysis, people lost on average similar amounts of weight on low carb and low fat, independently of their genetics or insulin secretion. And here's how the New York Times reported this finding. The key to weight loss is diet quality, not quantity, new study finds. But might we have missed something? In that primary analysis, we didn't look at a more visible difference between people, sex. And that's why we decided to run a secondary analysis of diet fits and see whether analyzing sex differences could help us find out whether anyone is winning at losing weight on a low-carb or a low-fat diet. But before I present you the results of the battle of the sexes and of the diets, let me tease you a little bit. Let's make a little detour and look at the broader picture of precision health for men and women and why it matters. Men and women are complex machines. They differ not only by sex, but also by gender. Sex and gender are not binary, but rather spectra. They interact with each other, and they can both help us personalize healthcare. Sex is biology. It's men's and women's hardware. It's what men and women are built of based on anatomy, physiology, and genetics. Gender, on the other hand, it's behavior. It's men's and women's software. It's how men and women behave based on society and culture. From the moment we are born, the world is not black and white, it's pink and blue. Those social constructs mold and shape our choices, from the toys we play with, dolls for girls, trucks for boys, 
to the foods we eat. Salads for women, steaks for men. Now, imagine you want to compare how two different computers run a certain task, but you forget to consider their hardware and software specifications. That would be bad computer science, wouldn't it? But what if I tell you that most biomedical science doesn't take into account sex and gender? Would you trust the science? You probably shouldn't. In fact, sex and gender can affect the way men and women respond to a drug or diet intervention. They can even affect whether they're actually compliant on that drug or diet or not. Let's take as an example a weight loss diet. Because of biological sex differences, men tend to lose more weight than women on a weight loss diet because on average they are bigger with more muscles and therefore consume more calories than women. But because of the gender stereotype that women should be slim, they try harder than men to lose weight, sometimes too hard. And that's why there are more anorexic women than men, but also more overweight women that become frustrated with dieting and eventually give up. As you can see, neglecting sex and gender can lead to imprecision health. Healthcare that is potentially useless and unequal for both men and women. And that's why a recent health policy from the National Institutes of Health highlights the importance of considering sex and gender in precision health. This health policy was an additional motivation for us to look at sex and gender differences in our secondary analysis of the Stanford Diet Fit Study. And with this, we are finally back to the battle you have all been waiting for, the battle of the sexes and of the diets. This work is currently under review for publication, so stay tuned. This is a battle with two rounds. Round one, the sex round, and round two, the gender round. In round one, we looked at sex differences by dividing our study population into men and women and measuring how much weight, body fat, and lean mass they lost over one year. And this time, we found something surprising, something that went unnoticed in our primary analysis. The men lost significantly more weight and body fat on low carb than low fat, whereas the women lost similar amounts of weight and body fat on both diets. In addition, within the low carb group, the men lost significantly more weight than the women even after accounting for baseline differences in body weight. That might sound like bad news for women, but before you all rant, ladies, please wait to watch round two, the gender round. In round two, we looked at behavioral differences in diet compliance, which, as we have seen, can be influenced by gender stereotypes. At the beginning of the trial, we had set a target of no more than 20 grams of 
net carbohydrates daily for the low carb diet and no more than 20 grams of fats daily for the low fat diet. Of course, everyone deviated from those targets. The question is who deviated more and on which diet? To answer this question, we calculated a deviation score for each diet. A positive score indicates a higher than average deviation from the target, lower compliance, and a negative score indicates a lower than average deviation from the target, higher compliance. And once again, we found something surprising. Women on low carb were by far the least compliant of all groups. They deviated significantly more from the target than both women on low fat and men on low carb. In contrast, men on low carb were the most compliant of all groups, but they were not significantly more compliant than men on low fat. And now that round one and round two are over, the moment you have all been waiting for. Who's the winner of our battle of the sexes and of the diets? The men or the women? Raise your hands for the men. Raise your hands for the women. <laughs> Raise your hands for both the men and women. Yeah. <laughs> Let's recap. The men lost significantly more weight and body fat on low carb than low fat, despite being similarly compliant on both diets. The women lost similar amounts of weight and body fat on low carb and low fat, despite being significantly less compliant to low carb than low fat. As you can see, they were all winners. Men and women with similar diet compliance lost similar amounts of weight after accounting for baseline differences in body weight. However, it was an easier ride on low carb than low fat. With similar diet compliance, weight loss was greater on low carb than low fat. Let's take as an example a group of men and women with similar diet compliance. Assuming that they started with a baseline weight of 100 kilos, the ladies would have lost seven kilos on low fat and nine kilos on low carb, whereas the gentlemen would have lost eight kilos on low fat and 10 kilos on low carb. This means that for women too, a low carb diet could be a powerful weight loss weapon. <laughs> Had the women in our study behaved well, they might, like the men, have lost more weight on low carb than low fat. But they didn't behave well. And the question is why? Women may be reluctant to embrace a low-carb lifestyle because eating fewer carbs means eating more fat. And women are scared about that. An extensive body of research indicates that fear of fats is greater in women than men. And that's perhaps why the lady in our study didn't behave well on the low-carb, high-fat diet, whereas the man ate fats with gusto or 
gusto for my American friends. <laughs> this fear of fats among women reflects the same gender stereotype we mentioned before. Women feel they should be slim and therefore avoid foods perceived as fattening, such as dietary fats. The marketing strategies of low-fat products reinforce this stereotype. Just look around at the supermarket. It's no coincidence that most low-fat yogurts are pink and labeled as light for both the body and the soul. I hope you can see now how sex and gender can help us improve our understanding of science and society and our ability to change them. Women can be part of this change by staying skeptical about gender stereotypes and positive, optimistic about escaping their pitfalls to improve their self-confidence and health. Many of you in this audience are already driving change as clinicians, scientists, health advocates, and food producers. Let's keep smiling and sweating in our battle for better health. Thank you. <laughs>